as a very young singer, I was invited to the Opera House in Berlin by the then director of the Opera House, Egon Seefellner, and I had one opera to my name that I, that I knew, and he felt that there was a lot that I could learn there, which was very true, and I was so lucky to be able to, get, be, to have this opportunity. And the thing that was happening is that I kept being offered operas that I knew that I wasn't ready to sing those, just from an experience point of view, and as well as being 24 years old. And so I was always asked to sing things that I thought, well, no, I, I really don't think I should sing that now. I need to sing that maybe in five years or maybe in 10 years, but not right now. Couldn't I please sing something else? And that, that became a difficulty for me. And after being at the Opera House for three years and singing uh, Elsa and Elizabeth, the Wagner roles that are not sort of the heavy Wagner roles, and then sort of Mozart operas that of course suited my voice at the time, I was continually sort of invited to sing things that I just felt I shouldn't. And so I took it upon myself to go to speak with the artistic director to say that I thought I should leave the Opera House and come back in some years when my maturity sort of chronologically would have caught up with the invitations that I was being offered. And of course, considering that he'd taken me into, into the Opera House when I knew one role, he wasn't all that happy. I thought he'd say, oh, how what a smart girl. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's what we'll do. No, no, no. He was absolutely furious. And I decided that I, I had to save myself by leaving the opera house. It isn't as though I had, you know, sort of sheaves and sheaves of work. I, I made this decision because I was trying to save myself. I, was, I have always sung more solo recitals with piano than, than opera, but it isn't as though I had sort of, you know, recitals lined up all over the world. I had two or three things that I knew that were coming up, but I didn't have a lot after that. So at that point in my very young life, I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to be able to continue because it wasn't certain that I would have enough work as a solo performer to support myself. And so there were probably about two months before I actually told my parents what I'd done. And when I called them, and my mother was on one extension and my father was on sort of the other one, which was in the kitchen, and there was stunned silence. And my father said, um, well, sister, um, how is it going since you've left the opera house in Berlin? And so I said, well, actually, I have two recitals in this place and another recital in that place, and I think I'm going to be all right. And at some point, Mother said, do you need to come home? A very wealthy industrialist by the name of J. Ralph Corbett from Cincinnati, Ohio, happened to be married to a person who had wanted to be a singer. And so she was therefore supportive of the Cincinnati Opera and they supported practically single-handedly the Cincinnati Symphony. And so they wanted to broaden their kind of interest in sort of supporting young American singers. And so they had the idea along with some people in the musical world, uh, in classical music that they trusted, and had discussions about how they might help American singers to sort of get going, because there really wasn't sort of a lot of support, financial support. And so they had the brilliant idea that instead of having American singers to traipse all over Europe at a, at a certain point singing for various directors of opera houses, that because they were in a position to do so financially, they would invite 25 directors of opera houses from all over Europe to come to the United States for two weeks, to wine and dine them in New York, to take them to the concerts, to the opera, to the theater, and during the day they had to sit there and listen to American singers all day long. And somehow I was invited to be a part of this. And I went along at my appointed time. It was in New York. 
and sang for this group of directors from uh, opera houses all over the place. And I sang the second aria from Tannhäuser, which is one of the early operas of Wagner. And it's a, it was a very good choice because you're only accompanied by the brass instruments in the, in the orchestra, which means unless you have very good breath control, you can't do this aria. It is very slow and it's very hymn-like in the way that it is composed. It's not sort of, you know, sort of a lot of uh, orchestral accompaniment, you know, that is kind of brilliant and spectacular. It really is a prayer. And so either you can pull it off or you can't. You really can't sort of cheat on it. And um, it's, again, you know, one of these fantasy stories. Egon Zeyfelner was one of the directors that was sitting there. He actually came backstage after I finished my little presentation and he said to me, do you know the rest of that opera? And so I said, no, but I could know it by next week. And he said, no, it doesn't need to be quite so early. <laughs> you would have time. So this was in May of the year. And he said, I have looked at my calendar all through the time that you were singing. And uh, I could offer you a date in November to sing this opera at my opera house. I said, fine, wonderful. I mean, at 23, what is not possible, you know? And so I said, um, that sounds like a good idea. Thank wow. you very much. So I set about working that opera backwards and forwards and up and down. I knew everybody's part. I went to Duke University <clears throat> to study conversational German because I had no intention of going to Germany and not being able to talk. It just, because I didn't know whether or not people spoke English. I simply, there was no reason that I could imagine this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I, it, it, it sounds like I'm making it up, but I went to rehearsals and went to my costume fittings, which were rather different from having a costume fitting at the University of Michigan for the opera that we did there. And um, I sang the performance and after the second act, which is the act in which my character first appears, Egan Zellfelner actually came to my dressing room. The opera wasn't finished. And he said, this is going very well. I'd like to offer you a three-year contract. And so I said, but Dr. Zellfelner, I haven't finished the opera. And he said, that's the aria that you sang, the aria that's coming up in the third act. That's the one that you sang in New York, and I know that you can sing it. There was a standing ovation at the end of the opera, I think, because everybody was just so surprised. I mean, one has to understand, think about this. 1969, the Berlin, the December of 1969, just a little bit before Christmas, the Berlin Opera House, an African-American singing a quintessential German character in a Wagnerian opera, in a German opera house. It is completely crazy when you think about it, but that's what happened to me. Imagine Berlin at the time. Herbert von Karajan directing the Berlin Philharmonic. You had all of these wonderful, I lived across the street from the Schiller Theater, which is one of still one of the great sort of theaters in Germany where I would go and listen to really well-spoken German. And so there was a, a lot that I was learning just from being in that particular place at the time. And so I went to the opera practically every night. I went to something practically every night, just learning and seeing and absorbing. And what I noticed is that there were singers that were only sort of slightly older than I, whose voices sounded as though they were many decades older than that and didn't sound pretty. And I, I needed to understand what was happening. I mean, there were singers that were, you know, 28 or 30 years old or something. And I would speak to them afterwards to say, you know, was your voice tired tonight? You know, what? Tell me what's happening because I didn't understand it. Their voices should have sounded fresh and blooming and, and wonderful, but instead they sounded different. And it was because they were singing a different opera every night and singing whatever was offered. And I 
didn't understand and needed to understand, because no one was telling me these things, why they just didn't say no. Why didn't they just say, oh no, I don't think I should. Because it certainly could have happened that I could have been fired earlier in the process, but I wasn't, I didn't have sense enough to worry about that. I was more concerned about preserving myself. I want to be able to express, I want to be able to communicate, and I want to be able to understand what it is I'm doing, and I want the people whose language it is to understand what it I'm doing. And to, and to help me with that, I, I need to, to listen to people speaking their own language, to listen to the difference in nuance, which of course is just, I just, lo I just love languages and I love, I love learning and I love listening. And I love being able to, to listen to Italian and to be able to tell that that person comes from North Italy and that person is from Southern Italy and that person is from Napoli. Only people from Napoli speak <laughs> Italian like that. And, and, I, and I enjoy that sort of thing. My parents told me that I started singing at the same time that I started speaking. So I have absolutely no memory of not singing. And it was and remains, thank goodness, a very natural thing for me to do because I've always done it. I was in the children's choir at the church, in the choir at the school, in first grade, and all the rest of it. And, and it wasn't that I had such an interesting voice, it was just a very loud voice. And so for a five-year-old or a six-year-old, I could always sing on my own and be heard, you see. So that was, that was, that, that was the interesting part at that time. I hope that things have changed over time. <laughs> The first time I recall singing in public, I was in the second grade. I'm sure that I sang in church before that, but I don't really have a memory of that. But I remember being in second grade, and we, the school, it was a huge school in the segregated South, at least 1,200 kids in school from first grade to eighth grade at the time. And Every Friday, the school would all come together in the auditorium when the principal would tell you whether you've been good children or bad children and all the things you need to do to be really good children. And so it was the responsibility of a class, you know, of the second grade or the third grade or the fourth grade to kind of present a kind of program on each of the Fridays. And it was now time for the second grade students to do this. And uh, my teacher at the time said, well, then you should sing Norman. I was always called by my last name because there were too many of us to remember our first names. And so she said, you can sing Norman because you sing so loudly, we won't have to sort of lower the microphone from the principal <laughs> when you're singing on stage. I took it to be a compliment. I think when I was about five, I read a book that still remains one of my favorites, and I give it to all of the little children in my family, and it's Ferdinand the Bull. And I love Ferdinand the Bull because Ferdinand didn't look like the rest of the animals and therefore had to, um, to think highly of himself to sort of get on in life. And I still think of that book. And every time I mention it, somebody sends me, you know, sort of another copy of Fernand the Bull. I give them away. One could only keep so many copies of the same children's book. But that was, that was a book that inspired me as a very young child. I know it isn't probably the answer that one is expecting to say, oh no, it was the first time I read Much Ado About Nothing of Shakespeare or something. No, it was Ferdinand the Bull. There was music all the time. The boys in my family played 
instruments in the bands at schools because we were, my father was the president of the PTA and my mother was the secretary of the PTA. And, you know, parents in those days would not have allowed the kind of things that are happening with the school's curriculum these days, all over the country and all over the world, that the arts are simply dropping out of the curriculum. They wouldn't have allowed it. They knew how much being a member of the chorus or a member of the movement group or a member of the poetry society or a member of the band, they realized how much this influenced everything else in our lives and that it was a part of education that really is just too important to be left aside. And so music was in my house all the time. My mother played piano. And one of the things that I talk about all the time is at Christmas time, we would do a version, if you can imagine it, of Messiah's the, the Hallelujah Chorus. Now with my mother playing the piano and I'm singing all of the parts of the chorus and one of my brothers is playing the tuba, somebody else is playing the trumpet and somebody else is playing the trombone. We would simply look at the music and choose a line of it to play. And there we were sort of doing this thing that really calls for a chorus and an orchestra, not five people in the hallway on the upright piano sort of doing <laughs> So if we hadn't known, I always say, if we hadn't known where Handel was buried at the time, we would have found out from the Norman rendition of the Hallelujah Chorus because he was certainly spinning in his grave. There were a lot of musical sort of children around. I mean, there were a lot of us that studied piano. I studied piano from the time I was very young. And all of us were sent out to piano, whether you wanted to or not. I mean, sort of the, the boys in my family, my three brothers had to study piano along with my sister and myself. And I cousins and everybody at school went to, to study piano lessons and to participate in various sort of musical things at the churches and schools. And it was a very normal thing to, to have music in the house and to have uh, sort of to come in on a Sunday afternoon, which was one of the great things of, of growing up, to come in on a Sunday afternoon from church and there was Leonard Bernstein doing the Young People's Concerts on television. It was one of the few things that we were allowed to watch on television and it was on Sunday in the afternoon and it was incredible. I mean, it was some sort of, it was almost as good as going to a concert because he spoke directly into the camera. He told you everything you needed to know about the music, and then the music was played. It was, it was, it was astounding, really wonderful. I was given my very own radio. I know that most kids sort of listening to this right now would just burst out laughing. But it was the greatest thing in the world. I was given my very own radio in my very own bedroom, which meant I could listen to anything that I wanted to. I didn't have to invite my brothers. I could close the door. And if I wanted to listen to Gunsmoke or to Elvis Presley or to the Metropolitan Opera on Saturdays, I could do that. And I would listen to the Metropolitan Opera because they had the most wonderful announcer. His name was Milton Cross. And Milton Cross would tell you everything you needed to know about the opera. Of course, I didn't sort of understand Italian or French or German or any of these things. But I didn't need to because Milton Cross told you everything you needed to know. He told you what Joan Sutherland was wearing, that she was very tall, that she was wearing a very beautiful blonde wig, and that her costume for Lucia de la Mamour was this beautiful teal blue color. So I could see all of this in my mind. And however long the opera lasted on a Saturday afternoon, that's how long it took me to clean my room, which was my job on the Saturday. <laughs> so if it was a long opera, it went on for a bit, my cleaning. I had the luck of having a, a teacher, several teachers, already in the fourth grade of Mrs. Printup, and then in the fifth grade of Mrs. Hughes, and in the sixth grade, when I'm, by the time I'm 11, of Mrs. Williams. And they knew that I was interested in this, and they also knew that my classmates were not. So on a Monday, after I'd sort of listened to the opera, if I'd sort of listened to the opera that Saturday, I, I would be asked by my various teachers, now, would you like to tell us what it was you heard on the radio on Saturday? I was happy to. The kids were bored to tears. You can just imagine it. You know, sort of 10-year-old boys, 10-year-old boys sort of sitting there listening to some girl go on about Leontine Price singing Aida. I mean, really, what is Aida anyway? And I would tell the story because I'd make notes when Milton Cross was sort of telling us what was going on so that I would be prepared. 
And so I had my, my little sort of shtick every kind of Monday morning, you know, sort of during the course of the, the year when the opera was on, that I might be called upon to talk about the opera. So I arrived with my notes and bored the class to absolute tears for at least 15 minutes. One of the operas, the one of the a wonderful septet from an opera of Donizetti, the one that I mentioned earlier, Lucia de la Mamour, it has such a beautiful, beautiful ensemble. And I memorized the tune because it was so pretty for, for my ears. And I had remembered it by the time sort of Monday turned around and I could talk about it to the class. And that was the one time that I think the boys in the class actually listened to what I was saying. I mean, just the most beautiful tune imaginable. I would have to choose being inspired by just hearing my grandmother sing her way through the entire day. She had a, a song for every time of day. In the morning, there was a kind of quick song, a spiritual that would be sort of rather faster than later in the day when she was perhaps more sort of contemplative or, or maybe just exhausted from the day. And I remember being taken by that, that she seemed to have her own kind of soundtrack that sort of accompanied her throughout the day. I didn't think of, that, think of it in those terms as a young child, but now in reflection, I, I think about her having her own soundtrack. And I think about being nine or 10 years old and the next door neighbor saying she had some 78s that someone had given her and she knew I was interested in that kind of music. And would I sort of like to listen to something? And I said, yes, of course I would. And we didn't have a stereo a player at the house, at our house that played 78s, but she had at her house that played 78s. So she gave me these, this stack of recordings and kind of left the room for me to have my own fun. And I found a recording of Marian Anderson's, whose name I'd already heard. And she was singing the Brahms Alto Rhapsody. And I was listening to that on that record player, as one referred to them in, in those days. And even though I had no idea of the meaning of the, the words, they sounded important to me. And the music sounded important to me. And I listened to it over and over again. And on the occasion at Carnegie Hall, many, many years later, when we were having a memoriam as by this time, Marian Anderson had passed, this was in 1997. And when Robert Shaw said to me, let's do the Alto Rhapsody, I said, well, I might not get through it because I might cry all the way through it because this is a very meaningful piece to me. But it was thrilling on that occasion in her memory to sing the first thing that I'd ever heard her sing ever. When I entered the competition, this is of course on paper, um, I was 15, but I knew that I would be the required age of 16 by the time the um, contest would occur. And this was an idea of my choir director from middle school. And so she told me about this and said, there's something called the Marian Anderson competition in Philadelphia, and one can enter from age 16 what I didn't understand at the time is that it went from age 16 to age 30. Mm -hmm. So there would be people in this contest that had a great deal more experience than this 15-year-old from Augusta, Georgia. But anyway, along we went, and there's a marvelous story that goes with that as well. Because my school principal decided that the school should participate in my going to Philadelphia. So on one particular day, and this is amazing when I think about it, he said that all of the children in this big school should, instead of spending their money for lunch, that they should give their money to me so that I would have extra money to go to Philadelphia. And the Board of Education paid for their lunch that day. 
so that there would be the act of their participating in my going to Philadelphia. Isn't that a wonderful story? I went to Philadelphia, and I didn't win the, the contest, of course. I mean, I was probably the youngest person that ever showed up. But I recall so well that the sister of Marian Addison came to me. She said, now, you're very young, but I want you to come back and sing for us once you've actually studied singing, because we're going to keep an eye on you. And as far as I was concerned, I had won everything. Marian Addison's sister had actually spoken to me. But you see, on the way back from Philadelphia, my, because my teacher, who was accompanying me, Rosa Sanders, my high school uh, music teacher, uh, was accompanying me, and we stopped in Washington because we both had relatives here. And so we were sort of visiting near the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial and all of that. And in the middle of the day, she said, well, why don't we, why don't we find out if anybody at Howard University is there and we'll listen to you sing? I said, well, that sounds like fun. You know, at that time, you don't care that you're tired and, you know, sort of perspiring from having sort of been sort of sightseeing all day long. It never occurs to you that you can't sing. And so she knew one of the professors at Howard because he had been a professor at Payne College in Augusta when she had been a student, and that's where she'd gone to school. So we just called this person. Dean Fax was his name, Mark Fax. And by now, he was on uh, faculty at the College of Fine Arts at Howard. And so we called, and he said, well, why not? You know, there's a, a, a class this afternoon that's a master's degree class in vocal uh, anatomy, so you could sing for that class. I said, why not? That's fine. So along we went and sang for that class, interrupted, you know, their studies, and just sort of knocked on the door and... The professor at the time was told, you know, that I was there, and so she welcomed us into the class where there was a, a small piano, and I sort of sang a few songs. And that professor happened to be Carolyn Grant, who had been professor of voice at Howard University for about 42 years at the time. She accompanied me and my um, teacher out of the room once we finished our little performance, and she said, how old are you? And so I said, I'm 16. I've just turned 16. I'm all grown up. And so she said, well, how, where are you in high school? And so I said, well, I, I've got another year. And she said, well, I suppose you'd have to finish high school before you could come to school here. And I said, come to school here? At that moment, she went down to the dean of the college and said, I want to teach this child. Make sure that she comes to Howard University. That's how I happen to have a scholarship to Howard University. I know, it's all fairy tales, isn't it? I understood about singing and, and music, of course, as I said, from a very early age, but I didn't understand about getting paid for singing. Because as a child, of course, you know, you get... Um, some something to drink and two butter cookies as a thank you for coming, you know, to whatever it is and singing. And that wasn't, that was even more than one expected. You know, you expected to have somebody shake your hand and say thank you, and that was the kind of end of it. So the the whole idea of becoming sort of one of these people singing on the radio from the Metropolitan Opera on the Saturday, that was very far from my mind because I had no idea as to how one would do that. But I did understand my other passion, which remains a passion of mine, which is medicine. It happens that the University of Georgia Medical School is in Augusta, Georgia, where I was born. So I saw people in white coats all the time going back and forth. I understood about going to university and then going to medical school and then getting a job. So up until age 17, which by this time I had a scholarship to, to come to Howard University to study in the College of Fine Arts, I was still making sure as a student in high school that I had the credits that I would need in order to go to liberal arts at Howard University and to prepare to go to pre-med. I tell the story all the time about my mother coming through my bedroom sometime in kind of August of 19 aught when I was getting ready to go to university. And you know how it is if you're going off to university or something the first time or going off to camp, you start packing long before you're supposed to go. You think you've got so many things and such a, a lot of things to organize that you start very early.
It was the first time I'd had a locker. So I was very interested in getting myself organized. This was weeks before I needed to show up in Washington. And my mother, who had a very special way of walking, sort of came through my bedroom. She said, well, darling, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, uh, but you do have a full scholarship to study music at Howard <laughs> University. But make up your own mind. <laughs> I was just very lucky, and we talk about all, the, all that, we talk about this a great deal with my siblings, that our parents were so supportive without sort of being on our necks. How did they do that? I mean, all of my siblings have, have children and are raising wonderful, wonderful, interesting children that are involved in their professional lives, but also in their communities. And they try very much to emulate what we learned at home, was to be there, but not pushing. I think that she saw great joy in the actual act of singing and that even though I was walking into a, a classroom of people, and it was a small classroom, it wasn't a big auditorium, you know, and people were sitting all around me, and that I was comfortable in that situation because, of course, that's the way you sing at church. I mean, if you're standing in, in church singing, I mean, there's somebody sitting in the front row, there's somebody sitting on the side, there are the deacons sitting to your right, so it's not like you're on a platform performing. And so I think that she saw a certain degree of enthusiasm and a certain degree of, of happiness just being allowed to do it. And I think that, that that sort of caught her eye and her ear, which was, of course, a glorious thing for me to be able to to work with someone, not having studied anything about voice before, how my parents understood that that would not have been a good idea is something about which I revel and celebrate every day of my life. Because you see, it could be very easy to ruin a young voice by having training in singing too soon, particularly for women those muscles in the middle of our bodies that actually support singing are still very much developing when we are teenagers. And if we go to those classes, which of course are proliferating all over the world now, because kids think if they can just you know, sing on television and be heard by the right person, they'll have a, a record deal, as it were, sort of overnight. That isn't the way life works, not real life. That's the way life works on television. And it really is so important not to try to use those muscles before they are fully developed. Because if you do that, the tendency is to use muscles in the neck and muscles that are not there for that. Those muscles are there for chewing. Absolutely. And if you, and I'm sure that you have noticed as well, that one can see rather young singers that participate and the jaw shakes. That's because the emphasis is being put on the wrong muscles. And they probably started doing it much too early because these muscles were not developed. So the body uses whatever there is. And the thing that I, I say to, to young singers to try to frighten them into not sort of taking themselves too seriously before the, the body is really ready for it is that these vocal cords are unforgiving. If we abuse them, if we use them in the wrong way too early, they stretch, and like any ligament, they don't go back. They don't go back. So it's not a matter of having sort of ruined your voice at age 16. If you can just be quiet for two years, everything is going to be all right. That isn't the way it works. It's not like a muscle that you can massage or you can give it an injection or something, or you can rest it and have it be all right in, in a matter of time. The vocal cords don't work like that. And so I was very lucky to work with Carolyn Grant to begin to understand how the voice is produced. She was a 
great vocal pedagogue, one calls the study of, of vocal anatomy. So I understood how all of this works, where the diaphragm is in the body and what part of the body sort of pushes the air out of the lungs and through the trachea and past the vocal cords and how this all works so that it's not some sort of mysterious things that happen happens in my body that, you know, maybe it's, you know, good one day and maybe it's not good the next day. At least I know how it's meant to function scientifically. It really is a part of my life. I, I bore the people in my family to tears. There are several uh, doctors and nurses and so on, and I'm always talking about what I've just read in the American Medical Association. And one of the youngsters in my family said, Aunt Jay, have you ever read Vogue? It, it's a really very nice magazine about clothing. You like clothes. Have a look at that sometime. I think it makes a difference for any of us to understand how it is that we produce something, whether it's a person that is an incredible marathon winner, I can hardly, hardly wait for the Olympics, or a person that is a, a magnificent swimmer, to understand what muscles are engaged at what point in that production of, of whatever it is you're doing. I think it simply, it quiets the mind to, to know how, how this thing in your body functions. First, I would say that um, I've contributed longevity, considering um, how long I've been doing this and how much I enjoy it and want to do it more. But I think one of the things, when I talk to, to younger performers, whether they're singers or violinists or pianists, is that I feel that I have encouraged them to go beyond the limitations of the box in which we can be placed as classical performers. That it really is all right to be a cellist and to play the Elgar Concerto, but to be also interested in the music of the Silk Road, as Yo-Yo Ma has shown so brilliantly that the music need not have been composed originally for the classical cello. That doesn't mean that you can't play it. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be interested in it. Why should a person who's playing the, the Brahms second piano concerto not be interested in the ragtime music of Scott Joplin? Why should a singer who's singing Mimi, a Puccini, not be interested in the music of Cole Porter. These, I feel that we so often limit ourselves because we think that we have to follow a certain line, that we have to, to follow and do what's been done before instead of finding our own paths and making our own way. I hope that my performance life encourages particularly other singers not to be limited, not to be put into a box and to be told you are that kind of soprano, so therefore this is the kind of music that you're supposed to sing. I said one clever thing, and I say this all the time, I said one clever thing in my entire life, and I was asked this question when I was about 23 or 24 years old, when I was sort of doing, you know, probably the second interview I'd ever done in my life. And the interviewer said, well, I mean, what kind of soprano are you? I mean, you sing this and you sing that and you've got sort of uh, fioraturi possibilities, meaning sort of like coloratura sopranos. Um, so what kind of soprano are you exactly? And so then I said, in all of my sort of 23 or 24 years, I think that pigeonholes are only comfortable for pigeons. I think that I find excitement in being able to communicate a thought to an audience without that being necessarily in the language of that particular person, but that by the way in which I hope that I'm singing, they would get the essence 
of what it is about which I'm singing. And that is exciting for me. I went some years ago to Greece and we were going to do an entire program in English, The Sacred Music of Duke Ellington, with gospel choir, sort of spiritual dancer, jazz combo, jazz ensemble, pianist, the whole thing, in this wonderful amphitheater, of course, created before the birth of Christ, practically. We call it Epidorus, but the, the Greeks call it Epidavros. And there we were sort of standing on the same piece of marble that Socrates stood on. I mean, these things are just surreal to me. And I was very concerned about singing in English the entire time and singing music that wasn't known. I mean, we know Sophisticated Lady and Take the A Train and so on, but we're not quite so familiar with the sacred music of Duke Ellington. But the moment you hear it, you know that it's Duke Ellington, whether or not you've heard the music before or not. And I was concerned about that, and I need to be, because the audience, even though, imagine we are outside, it's summertime, and of course there's a full moon. It was absolutely stunning, and it was as quiet that 15,000 people sitting in that amphitheater, it was quieter than singing in a church. And one understood from the quality of the silence that people were listening, that they weren't just being quiet, you know, until the, the concert was over. There was, it was a listening quiet. You could sense that. And after it was over, they expressed their joy in having heard this music, and it was overwhelming. I shall never forget that night as long as I live. Strauss had a very special way, and this might be due to the fact that he was married to a singer, but he had a wonderful way of writing for the female voice. Anybody that sings his music says the same thing. It is written in such a wonderful way. He understood how the female voice functions. And there's just so much that for which I'm just so grateful for the music of Strauss. It's given me such a presentation of music for, for so long in my performance life, whether it's the, the operas, Ariadne, or whatever, or the four last songs of Strauss. I can't imagine what my life would be like minus those songs. I just, I can't even imagine it. When I started working, you still had Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Christa Ludwig, Hermann Pry, Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau, and these are just four of the big names. The experience of listening to so many singers sing this repertoire, and that it was so inspiring, because they made it, they made it seem so natural and so easy. And of course, it is everything except easy. <laughs> but one learns that when one is learning to perform. But I was inspired by the work that they did and by the fact that they could have a full house and they were singing very quietly some songs of Hugo Wolf, some songs of Johannes Brahms, some songs of Mozart or Beethoven. There was no stage set. There was nothing spectacular about what was happening on stage except the piano and the voice. Well, I can honestly say that I have not sung any opera roles that I didn't really, really want to do. But I, if, I suppose if I had to choose one, I would probably choose Dido in the Trojans of Berlioz. Because first of all, the music is so beautiful. 
And the story is glorious. I mean, you have sort of the the fourth book of the Aeneid, you know, as your opera libretto. And uh, we, I admit that opera libretti, the words can be a little um, less than great literature, shall we say. <laughs> a little bit uh, ridiculous, to say the least. I mean, try to explain the story of Il Trovatore of Verdi, somebody without sort of breaking into laughter. I mean, it's... <laughs> but um, to have that text that was translated into French, just to have words that are that beautifully translated and that they're beautiful to say, and then to have them set to music. I mean, it's really, it's it, that, I suppose if I had to choose one, I would choose Dido. I love Italian opera. I don't sing a great deal of Italian opera, but I love to listen to it from other people, absolutely. One of my favorite roles to listen to is La Traviata. I love the role of Violetta in that opera. I really just love it. It's not, it's not for my voice at all. It's not for my sort of kind of voice, even my sort of very different voices. There isn't one of those voices inside of me that would sort of suit that role. I suppose that's one of the reasons I love to listen to other people sing it. I've had the odd experience of, of working um, with my, my colleagues who would have preferred that I should keep quiet when I have uh, expressed a, a differing <laughs> opinion to what was going on. I was working, for instance, years ago. I was just thinking, working years ago for uh, one of the Queen's birthdays in, in, in Britain. And the conductor wanted to do some music of Scott Joplin, except I don't think he'd ever seen any music of Scott Joplin before, much less sort of performed it. And it was a slow drag, which is in two. And he was doing it in four, which is and there were a couple of other singers involved, and this was our first rehearsal, and it was with the piano, so we weren't, you know, with the orchestra yet. And he kept doing that, and we finally had a, a pause in the rehearsal, and I sort of went forward, I said, excuse me, um, but actually a slow drag is in two, not four. So if we could go through that perhaps again, but, and he says something like, well, it's your music, you must, you must know about it. And so I said um, in response, we can talk about the great symphony uh, in C of Schubert if you'd like. <laughs> I have some things to say about that too. So it, it shows you that people would sometimes rather you just sort of do what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sing. You're not supposed to sort of point out that he's actually conducting the piece in the wrong meter. I waited so long because I was waiting for a very good reason, and that was to be offered a role that would be suitable for me. I sang as a, it was, they're not, well, maybe I'm being incorrect in this, but I actually sang Aida with the Orlando Opera Company in the 70s. And it, it wasn't until 1982 that uh, I was offered something that I thought, now this will be a good way to sing opera in the United States. And it was with the Philadelphia Opera. And I was asked to do Oedipus Rex of Stravinsky along with Dido and Aeneas of Henry Purcell. I thought, first of all, it was a very interesting double bill. And that was the thing that sort of interested me enough to say, okay, let's do it. And then the next year, I sang, of course, for the 100th anniversary, first night of, of the Opera House in New York at the Met Opera. So that felt wonderful. And it meant so much to so many. I had no idea that it would mean so much to so many other people. It never occurred to me that anybody was paying attention to that. 
But the, the amount of mail that I received from people saying, you know, thank goodness you finally come to the Opera House here in New York. I, I had been offered roles at the Opera House in New York for 10 years. It's just that it hadn't been anything that I felt that would be suitable for me or that I would enjoy doing. So uh, I was very lucky in that they hadn't lost interest and, and continued to, to ask, but I had no idea that it meant anything to anybody else. Truly, I just wasn't thinking that. I never thought about it because I was singing very often in the States with orchestras, singing recitals with piano. So I was singing, I just wasn't singing in the opera house. And it never occurred to me that anybody else was thinking about it, I promise you, it was amazing. I was asked by President Mitterrand through an emissary of his a year before the celebration should take place. And I have been singing in France all of my performing life and have a very special relationship, which I treasure, with um, the, the French musical public. And I was very concerned that perhaps because I spent so much time performing there, I was very concerned that perhaps uh, President Mitterrand thought that I was from Haiti or from uh, Cameroon or you know from a former French colony in Africa or somewhere. And so I said to the person who was asking me, me this on the behalf of the president, Monsieur Du Pavillon was his name. I said, "Does the president realize that I'm American and that I'm I'm not French in any way?" And so I said, "Yes, the president rather knows what he's doing." Thank you, Miss Hall. And so I was very flattered, of course. And on the occasion of, of singing this national anthem for the bicentennial of the French Revolution, it still sounds kind of implausible, um, I, was, I was very comfortable. I was very happy to be a part of it. And everybody else around me, the people that were responsible for it, were as nervous as they could be. I mean, at one point, one of the people in charge of the entire sort of parade, as we call it, it's called a défilé in French, uh, came to me and said, are, are you nervous? And so I said, no. And he said, how can you not be nervous going out to sing for three billion people watching sort of, you know, on television all over the world, not to mention the people that are actually on the Champs-Élysées and at the Place de la Concorde. And so I said, I practiced. I know the tune, <laughs> I practice the words. You could wake me up in the middle of the night and say, sing the third verse of the national anthem of France and it would come out of me. So I'm just gonna have a good time. I'm go I get to wear the tricolor, the, the French colors as a dress, as an American singing the Marseillaise. I'm not nervous, I'm having a wonderful evening. The Star Spangled Banner, it is unsingable. No, truly, and I, I know that there are people who say, you know, she must be absolutely crazy, but I really do feel that the Star Spangled Banner, it covers too much territory. That is an octave and a fifth. That means you've got 13 notes that are incorporated into our national anthem for a song that is to be sung by a general public one octave is enough. And the song that I wish we had as a national anthem is America the Beautiful. It doesn't talk about war. It doesn't talk about anything except the beauty of this land and the joy that we should have in being in this land. And I, it's a, a much more, for me, much more beautiful song, even though I understand completely the, the rousing that happens in the heart from listening just to the opening bars of the Star Spangled Banner. I still happen to be the only singer that's ever done Erwartung of Schoenberg and La Voix Humaine of Poulenc on the same evening. 
And the Voix Humaine is um, the human voice. The play is by Jean Cocteau. And the music is by Francis Poulenc. And these are very demanding and very different characters and very different operas. But I en enjoy the challenge. I mean, th I've also done in one evening, going back to the Trojans, having mentioned that Dido, if I had to choose one role, that I would choose that one. But I've also done, because the opera, the Trojans, is done in two parts. And I've done Cassandra, who's the character, the female lead in the first part. And I've also done Dido on the same night. They have a new production of the Trojans at Covent Garden, which is wonderful. And, and, and some of the singers, I was visiting with them backstage, and one of the singers came to me and said, my agent told me he was at the Met when you did both parts. How in the world could you do both parts? I'm exhausted after singing Cassandra. I said, well, you have to carbo load the night before. You have to prepare for that the way a marathon runner would prepare to run for 26 miles. Why anybody would want to run for 26 miles <laughs> is beyond my understanding, but that's something else again. So you have to prepare your body to have enough stored energy upon which you can call once you know the day arrives that you've got to do this. So I eat a completely different sort of in a different manner when preparing for something that's going to happen like that the next day. It is a responsibility. I'm very grateful for it. But at the same time, it can really get on other people's nerves, you know, saying, well, we have to turn off the air conditioning and I mustn't be in a draft and all the rest of it. Everybody else is, you know, sort of fanning themselves because it's so hot. And I'm sitting there saying, but I can't be in air conditioning because it will give me sinusitis and all the rest of it. And sometimes, particularly the little people in my family will say, can't you just take your voice out and put it on the table <laughs> so that we can sit in the car in Atlanta, Georgia in the summer with the air conditioning on? No, they don't get it. They don't understand that all you're doing is trying to preserve your sort of work activity. This is your profession. And people would prefer that you show up sort of not hoarse and with sinusitis and everything else going on that can happen from having a cold. I try to understand the popular music of today because I have young, lots of young people in my family and I want to be sort of on top of things, you see. Mm -hmm. So I um, sort of need them to sort of direct me as to what to, to, to listen to and who's the, the new hot thing and all the rest of it. But I do sometimes find that it's too facile for me, that it's too easy, that the words don't really mean anything, and the, the words are repeated without their meaning anything more the second time around, and that there is something rather wonderful and satisfying. Listen to a really good text. To listen to really wonderful lyrics. And that, that for me is missing in a great deal of popular music these days. And, and people that are working in the classical field are beginning to understand also that writing for the voice in contemporary music is rather different from writing for the trombone or writing for an orchestra, orchestra and that one has to understand how the human voice works. And that is not the same. As, a, as, a, as another instrument. And, but it's wonderful that composers are beginning to write really well for the, for the voice. I decided years ago that I would never, ever work as an adjudicator. As a kid going around singing in various competitions and various contests and so on, I decided long ago that I would never do that. I've been asked several times, not for that particular thing, but to adjudicate a vocal competition. And I was very flattered to be asked to do this for a jazz uh, 
uh, organization sort of just a couple of years ago. And I said, I won't do that because I have seen judges make so many mistakes that people that have had potential have been discouraged because they, a judge said, oh, well, you're just, you know, you're not what we're looking for, or you don't have the right look, or you don't have the right sound, or whatever, and they've been discouraged. And people who really had, were a kind of a one pony show have been chosen, and they haven't sort of gone beyond that one pony show. And so I determined very early in my professional life that it would take more than is, I think, available to simple humans to be able to determine that a person at age 18 is going to still be singing or playing the violin or playing the piano at age 40. Your own experience can't determine that. You're a completely different person from that youngster that is on stage singing, you know, the waltz from uh, Puccini's, you know, Bohème or something. I have learned that achievement is ongoing. It's like learning that you don't, certainly within the, my performing life, you don't get to a point where you can say, now I can rest. I've done that, so now I can sit on laurels. That's not the case. There's always someone in the audience who's never heard you before. There's always something new that I'm performing for the first time. I like that. I love that. On a tour, I never sing exactly the same program everywhere. I wanted the excitement of knowing, oh yes, well, we didn't do that Cole Porter song in that group in Paris, but we're doing it in Lyon. Because that keeps things fresh for me, and I think it, I hope that it also keeps things more interesting for the audience. But certainly I have learned that one has to go on achieving, that one doesn't get to a level to say, okay, now I'm, I'm fine, don't have to worry anymore. No, 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 I don't think that happens. The American dream means to me that people who need the support that can only be given by a government, that they are given what is needed in order to live, not just to survive, but to thrive. I am so exhausted from hearing this business about pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps. There are people in our country that are not wearing boots. And that not to understand that it is the responsibility of a society to look out for the least of us is for me a very wrong way of looking at life and living. The American dream is realized only when we come to the point of understanding, when we see a person that is not doing very well in life, if we can understand that for the grace of God, go I, and that it is our responsibility to lend a hand, a hand up. People don't want a hand out. They want a hand up. And the American dream to me is understanding and participating in that, not achieving something on one's own and letting that be all that happens in one's life. But to understand sometimes you need to reach back, sometimes you've got to reach on the side and say, hey, come along, don't be sad, this is going to work out. 
You'll never walk alone. I'm in Washington because of the 19th International AIDS Conference, at which I had the pleasure of singing and to make a little speech about the wonderful people who give their time, their emotional support, their incredible scientific minds working towards a cure, or certainly at least a vaccine for AIDS after all these years. And I told them that um, Rodgers and Hammerstein actually created an anthem for them long ago in Carousel when he wrote what they've been saying for 30 years to people involved and affected by AIDS, you'll never walk alone. So I was very pleased to be able to sing that last night. I had the pleasure in Paris of meeting Dr. Montaigne, who is one of the people at the very beginning of this scientific study of this incredible virus in the early 80s was one of the doctors working on identifying and calling this something. And to have conversations with him about how do you put something under a microscope that you've not ever seen before that looks like something from hundreds of years ago because of the way it looks under the microscope. And you see that it is happening in bodies all over the world now. How do you even begin to identify it? And he says, just a little bit at a time until you can understand how it works, what it is. Is this a bacteria? Is this a virus? Is this is something that can be stopped with antibiotics that are already existence? None of that proved to be true was such a mystery, of course, as for everybody, when the disease first appeared. And being in the performing arts, it turned out that a lot of my friends and colleagues were affected first. And it was a complete mystery as to what it was, how it was sort of passed on, and all the rest of that. And, and in a very short period, I lost a lot of people, like a lot of us, a lot of friends and was very confused by this and decided whatever it is, we have to work towards finding out what it is and how it is transmitted and how it can be cured. And so I started working with various organizations, principally in New York City, an organization called Bomb and Gilead, run by sort of the very dynamic Pernessa Seal. And they sort of relocated to Richmond, Virginia about five years ago. And they are still very, very active. But we were able, one of the things that we did was to put on um, a concert at the Riverside Church in sort of about 1997, I think it was, our first one. And we sort of, I arranged it in the, the way that a Baptist church in the South would organize a service so that we had the choir to process in, singing a spiritual, and then we had the scripture, and Whoopi Goldberg was our preacher, and our guest in the audience happened to be Elton John. And so I was able to have Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and Anna DeVere Smith and Bill T. Jones and Max Roach at the time, all of these people sort of as a member of the congregation who just happened to be there and sort of wanted to come and sort of praise the Lord sort of in the name of looking for a cure for AIDS. And already 15 years ago, at the time of this first performance, the uh, scientists were telling us that in about 10 years' time, it could be that there would be a vaccine. But of course, we know that, you know, that didn't happen. And everybody is still working furiously to, to find out what can be done. But a, a lot of progress has been made and that this mother-to-child transference is now a thing of the past in the United States and is fast becoming a thing of the past all over the world. And as was mentioned last night by 2015, this part of the AIDS crisis should be over. And that is really very encouraging. And there is a new method of determining whether or not you happen to be HIV positive that one can do at home that you don't have to even use a number. One is, of course, wanting to keep one's medical information private, but that it is possible to do these tests at home and to find out for yourself in the company, hopefully, of somebody that's going to be with you because it can be devastating, I'm sure, to find out this news on one's own. But to be able to do it in the privacy of one's own home is a great step forward, and that's just sort of in the last month or so that that's come to the fore.
I love to quote Einstein when he actually said that for him, the gift of fantasy, the act of creativity in his life, the brilliant life of this brilliant man, that the act of fantasy, creativity, had meant more to him in his life than the ability for absorbing knowledge. Can you imagine that? From Einstein? That the gift of going into one's own mind and thinking of something, thinking that there could be something called the internet that could connect people all over the world through a little machine that is on your desk or on your lap or nowadays in your handbag. From where does it come? It comes from deeply inside of us. It comes from that place that is not trying to do anything except live. It isn't thinking about whether or not this is a good idea, whether or not anybody else is going to think this is a good idea, whether it's a workable idea. It is simply there. And some people have the courage to go with it. I had the privilege of just sort of seeing Bill Gates receive an award last night and had to chat to him just a moment. And when I think of my friends that were in California at the time that there was something in Bill Gates' garage that he wanted people to see and that he thought was going to be something very interesting and there were people that were smart enough to say, okay, I'll go with you, and other people that said, don't be so silly, uh, that he kept going anyway. And look where it has taken us. And people working in this field in technology tell us we are only at the beginning. It works in my world by allowing me to, as it were, as I said before, to step outside of the box, to work with Bill T. Jones when he's sort of we are doing a performance and we're working on steps and so on. And Bill says it's going to be 17 to the right and then you're going to step back with your right foot 11 times and then you're going to move over here on a count of three. And I say to Bill, why can't we have sort of numbers that are even? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, why? If you can count to 11, if you can count to 10, you can count to 11. But I think that creativity to me means going with whatever is in your mind that is going to make your life more interesting and fun, whether it's your personal life or your professional life. But that with everything that is going on, with all of the need and the suffering in the world, that we find time to have a good time. This is a very short existence that we have on this earth. 